Hello there, everybody. Welcome back to ITTV. For today's lesson, we look at um, the regulation of blood pressure and comparison of different circulatory systems. So for today's Form 5 biology lesson, let's look at how blood pressure is regulated and we compare the different circulatory systems between humans, amphibian and fish in particular. So, other than not being able to synthesize our own food, what is one other distinct characteristic that makes humans and most animals different from plants? What do you think? Yes, you're right. Um, we can move from place to place, but plants, they cannot move from one position to another. So, let's look at the learning outcomes for today's lesson on Transport, Chapter 1. Firstly, to explain briefly how blood pressure is regulated. Secondly, to compare and contrast the circulatory system in the following, which will be humans, fish and amphibians, and to conceptualize the circulatory system in humans. So as we know, blood pressure is very important in ensuring sufficient flow of oxygen in the blood to the heart. It is the force of the blood on the walls of arteries. Let's look at the mechanism of blood pressure. Blood pressure is the force of the blood on the walls of the arteries. A normal healthy adult blood pressure is 120 AT, millimeter mercury. The highest reading is during systolic pressure. That is when the contraction of the ventricle happens. As you can see, a normal healthy adult blood pressure is about 120 AT, millimeter mercury. And 120 refers to the highest reading during systolic pressure, which is when the contraction of the ventricles happen. Whereas AT refers to the lowest reading during diastolic pressure, that is when the relaxation of the ventricles happen. So that is what it means by the value 120 slash 80 millimeter mercury. Now, whereas the lowest reading is due to diastolic pressure, that is when the relaxation of the ventricles happens. Now, this is just what is explained just now. And if we move on, baroreceptors are the stretch sensitive receptors located in the walls of the iota and the carotid arteries. Baroreceptors detect and monitor the pressure of the blood. Now, as you can see um, in the diagram, baroreceptors are located um, you know, in the carotid sinus and also in the iotic arch. So they're very important because they monitor the blood pressure which flows to the body and the brain. Now, so what exactly happens when there is increase in blood pressure? So when blood pressure is high, the baroreceptor stretches and impulses are sent to cardiovascular center in the medulla oblongata. And you can see in the diagram, right? Okay, moving on. Then what happens would be um, from the medulla oblongata, impulses are sent to the heart via the parasympathetic nerve. This causes the smooth muscles of arteries and cardiac muscles to relax. This then lowers the blood pressure and slows down the heartbeat to normal. So that is what happened when there is an increase in blood pressure. Now, let us have a look at what happens next when there is a decrease in blood pressure. Now, when the blood pressure is low, the sympathetic nerve increases stimulation of the sinoatrial node. Following that, this causes an increase in contraction of cardiac muscles and smooth muscles of the heart. 
This results in an increase of blood pressure to the normal level, as you can see in the diagram. Now, what is a sphygmomanometer? It is an instrument used to detect blood pressure. People with high blood pressure have higher chances of getting heart attack or stroke. Low blood pressure causes vital organs such as the brain and the heart to receive insufficient blood. Now, as you recall, the normal blood pressure was 120-80 mm mercury and any value which is above 140-90 mm mercury represents a hypertension state. That means the person has high blood pressure. If any value which is above 160 slash 95 millimeter mercury is considered very dangerous. And um, as you recall, an increase in blood pressure results from gradual increase in the resistance to blood flow through the arteries, which then causes the heart to have to pump harder to force the blood through. And people with high blood pressure, therefore, have higher chances of getting heart attack and stroke. And the heart is working so hard. An uncontrolled hypertension may damage the heart, the brain and the kidneys. Therefore, if one knows that a person has high blood pressure or hypertension, one needs to maybe take certain steps to control the hypertension. Whereas on the other side, low blood pressure causes vital organs such as the brain and the heart to receive insufficient blood. Ultimately, this can cause these organs to fail, to function properly and even to become permanently damaged. Chances is also there to experience blackouts, particularly when standing up or sitting up too quickly after lying down. So, having high blood pressure or low blood pressure is not beneficial for the body and it needs to be rectified, it needs to be controlled. So now, let's look at other closed circulatory systems, um, focusing on the circulatory system in the fish. Now, the closed circulatory system are found in vertebrates and a closed circulatory system means blood flows under pressure via closed vessels continuously around the body. Contraction of the heart creates pressure which maintains the flow of the blood. So we now compare the circulatory systems in fish, amphibians and humans. Now fish has two chambered heart consisting of one atrium and one ventricle. It has a single closed circulatory system which means that blood flows through the heart only once in a complete cycle. Now, as you can refer to the diagram, deoxygenated blood, which is blue in colour, enters the atrium followed by into the ventricle. In the ventricle, the deoxygenated blood are pumped to the gills so that gaseous exchange occurs. Drop in pressure in gills as the oxygenated blood leaves and flows directly to tissues in the body. Whereas, the deoxygenated blood flows back to the heart and the cycle continues on. So, as you can see, the deoxygenated blood, which is blue, enters the atrium and very fast flows into the ventricle. In the ventricle, the deoxygenated blood are pumped to the gills because fish do not have lungs, they have gills. So the oxygenated blood is pumped to the gills so that over there, gaseous exchange can occur. Now, if we move on, pressure in the gills drop as oxygenated blood leaves and now the blood is red in colour to show that it's rich in oxygen. And um, the, de the oxygenated blood will flow directly to the tissues in the body whereas when the blood becomes deoxygenated after flowing through the systemic capillaries it will flow back to the heart and the whole cycle will continue. So the circulatory system in fish is very simple. 
and they call it a two chambered heart. Now let's look at the circulatory system in the amphibians. Amphibians have three chambered hearts consisting of two atria and one ventricle. This means that there is no septum that is dividing the ventricle. It's very interesting. Look at the diagram. Now, unlike fish, amphibians has double closed circulatory system, which is the pulmonary circulation system and the systemic circulation system. This means that blood flows through the heart twice in a complete cycle. A bit similar like humans because blood flows through our heart two times in a complete cycle. But the difference is that the human heart has a septum that divides the left and the right ventricle. Whereas for the amphibian like a frog or a lizard, they have no septum to divide the two ventricles. And that means oxygenated and deoxygenated blood will mix together. So as you can see, Gaseous exchange in amphibians happens through the skin and the lungs. And what happens is that, as you can see, in the ventricle, both the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood are mixed. Now, before that, let us look at the pulmonary circulation. The pulmonary circulation system is the flow of blood from the heart to the lungs. Whereas systemic circulation is the flow of blood from the heart to other parts of the body, to the different tissues of the body. Now, even though for the amphibian circulation system, the oxygen in the blood is low due to the mixing of blood, it is sufficient for the cellular needs. In the water, amphibians use their skin for respiration instead of lungs. So, as mentioned just now, in the ventricles, the oxygenated and the deoxygenated blood will mix together. So, and it's okay because the composition of oxygen in that blood in the ventricles, which is pumped to the different parts of the body, is sufficient to meet the needs of the amphibian tissues. So, as you can see, Gaseous exchange can also happen via the skin when an amphibian is in the water. Now, the ventricle diverts the blood from the body past the lungs which then sends it to the skin for further gas exchange with the water. On the land, amphibians undergo respiration by breathing in air into the lungs for gaseous exchange. So as you can see in water, they breathe through the skin, but on land, they undergo respiration by breathing in air into the lungs for gaseous exchange. So that was about the circulatory system in fish and amphibians. Now, let us look at the circulatory system in humans. Humans have four chambered heart consisting of two atria and two ventricles that prevent mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. As you can see in the diagram that our ventricles are divided by a septum that prevents the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood from mixing together because definitely they cannot mix together because it's not supply it's not enough the oxygen content is not enough to supply the body cells needs the human heart ensures high supply of blood as metabolic rate is high and tissues require a rich supply of oxygen and nutrients and the circulatory system in humans has a double closed circulatory system which is the pulmonary circulation system and systemic circulation system. Now this reminds you of the amphibian circulatory system because there are the two circulatory systems. One will be the pulmonary and the second one would be the systemic circulation system. This means that the blood flows through the heart twice in a complete cycle. This is exactly like the amphibian circulatory system. Now, let us look at how the circulatory system in humans work. The left ventricle contracts and has thick muscle so that it's able to maintain high blood pressure for supplying oxygenated blood to the body tissues. 
so the muscle is very thick. In contrast, the right ventricle is smaller in size and less muscular because it needs only lesser pressure, sufficient enough to supply the blood from the heart to the lungs, which is shorter in distance. As you can see, the pulmonary um, circulation is important and the right ventricle would have thinner muscles because the blood only needs to reach to the lungs which is a shorter distance compared to for example the left ventricle which has to supply blood to even cells right down to our feet so therefore um, the right ventricle or I mean the left ventricle actually has thicker muscle so that it can pump blood with enough force to supply blood even to our toes. So now let us look at some mastery tests. What is the name of receptors that monitor the pressure of the blood? A. Baroreceptors B. Sensory receptors C. Mechanoreceptors and D. Pressure receptors so everybody, why don't you have some time to very quickly think of the name of the receptor that controls blood pressure. Yes, the answer for this question is A. Baroreceptors, they monitor the blood pressure of the blood against the arterial wall. Now let's look at the second question. What happens when blood pressure increases? A. Impulses sent via parasympathetic nerves to medulla oblongata. Impulses sent via sympathetic nerves to medulla oblongata. C. Impulses sent via parasympathetic nerves to the heart. Or D. Impulses sent via sympathetic nerves to the heart. So what do y'all think is the answer? I think yeah, you would really have to think about it carefully because the answers seem to be very close. Now as you remember, for homeostasis, when blood pressure increases, the blood pressure has to decrease back. And how does the blood pressure decrease? This can only be achieved when the heart doesn't contract so much, the heart doesn't contract so hard. So the answer for this question is obviously C. When impulses are sent via parasympathetic nerves back to the heart, then the heart will relax. It will not contract so hard. Now, let us look at question number three. What will happen if blood pressure is higher than 120 slash 80 millimeter mercury? A. Vital organs receive insufficient blood. B. Vital organs fail to function properly. C. High chances of heart attack or stroke. D. Chances of experiencing blackouts. Now, what do you think is the answer for question 3? Yes, you're right, because any blood pressure higher than the normal, um, normal rate of 120-80 is indicative of high blood pressure. And anybody with high blood pressure or hypertension has a higher chance of getting heart attack or stroke. Now, let's look at question 4. What is the name of the instrument to measure blood pressure? A barometer, sphygmomanometer, pressure meter or blood meter? Uh, this question is very easy. I'm sure some of you have the answer already. Yes, you're right. The answer is B. Sphygmo manometer. Question 5. Amphibians have three chambered hearts. What does this mean? A. Amphibians has three chambers in the heart. 
Amphibians has two ventricles and one atrium. Amphibians has one ventricle, one septum and one atrium or Amphibians has two atria and one ventricle. So what is the answer? Now if you're paying very close attention to the lesson, you remember that three-chambered heart doesn't necessarily mean that there are three chambers in the heart. But for the amphibian, it would be two atria and one ventricle. And the answer is D. That certainly it's not B. That amphibians have not two ventricles and one atrium. That is totally off. And C is wrong because amphibians have no septum to divide the two ventricles. So the answer is, is answer D. Now question 6. Amphibians can survive in water and land because A. Respiration can happen through skin and lungs, both in water and on land. B. Respiration can happen through skin and water and lungs on land. C. Respiration can happen through skin on land and lungs in water. D. Respiration can happen through all the organs, both in water and on land. Ah, uh, this question is pretty tricky. So you'd have to look carefully at the answers again and think of what the answer is. Now, as you recall, the answers seem to be very close. That it's true that amphibians, they respire either through skin or lungs in their closed circulatory system. Now, but you must remember that amphibians only breathe through their skin when they are in water. So you just try to spot for the answer that says, respire through skin in water, respire with lungs on land, just like us. On land, they are just like humans. They breathe through their lungs. So A, ha respiration happens through skin and lungs, both in water and on land. Now that's obviously wrong. Now B, respiration happens through skin in water, lungs on land. Now that is the correct answer. So the answer for question 6 is B. And that would mean that part C and D would be wrong because the answer is obviously B. Now, question 7. When does systolic and diastolic pressure happen? A. Systolic pressure happens during contraction of ventricles and diastolic pressure happens during relaxation of ventricles. B. Systolic pressure happens during relaxation of ventricles and diastolic pressure happens during contraction of ventricles. C. Systolic pressure happens during contraction of atria and diastolic pressure happens during relaxation of atria. D. Systolic pressure happens during relaxation of atria and diastolic pressure happens during contraction of atria. Now, this is also quite tricky. Do take some time to think of the answer. Now, to know this answer, you have to be very clear that when we talk about systolic and diastolic pressure, it's about ventricles, nothing to do with atria. So therefore, answer C and D is out because the answer is with regards to the contraction and relaxation of the atria. So C and D are removed. Now, so let's look at A and B. So, the answers are tailored with regards to the ventricles. Now part A, systolic happens during contraction of ventricles, that is right, while diastolic pressure happens during relaxation of ventricles, and that is truly right. So the answer for question 7 is A. Now B would be the opposite of the answer in A. And B is obviously wrong because systolic pressure always happens for contraction of ventricles. Now moving on. Question 8. Which circulatory system has both pulmonary circulation system 
and systemic circulation system. One goldfish, two piranha, three frog, four human. So A will be one and two, B one and three, C two and four, and D three and four. I'm sure you can guess the answer for this question easily. What did you think? Was your answer D? If you did, you are right. Give yourself a big pat on the back. Now, if you recall, we compared the circulation system of fish, amphibians, and humans. And if you remember, the circulation system for fish is, um, is only the systemic circulation system. It does not have the pulmonary circulation system. So, any answers which involves the fish circulatory system would be incorrect. So therefore, goldfish and piranha would be out. Piranha is a type of carnivorous fish and therefore, it's not in the answer. But amphibians and humans, we have quite similar circulatory systems. And our circulatory system is known as the double closed circulatory system consisting of the pulmonary and systemic circulation system. Therefore, the answer will be 3 and 4, which will be option D. Now, question 9. So what is the pulmonary circulation? A is the flow of blood from the heart to and from the lungs. B, pulmonary circulation flow of blood from the heart to other parts of the body. C, pulmonary circulation is the flow of blood from the heart to the lungs only. While D, pulmonary circulation is the flow of blood to the heart from other parts of the body. Now, what do you think is your answer for this question? Do think carefully about it and I'm sure you will be able to get the answer. Now, for this answer, perhaps we could look to the board and I would just draw a simple diagram of um, you know, the amphibian circulation system. So let's look at the amphibian circulatory system. So this part would be the circulatory system, all right? And this will be, okay. It's a very funny looking heart though. Okay, a very simple system. Okay, and this is will be the iota. And as you can see, this part here, this part here will be the systemic capillaries. Okay, it's a very um, rough drawing of the amphibian circulatory system. So this part here will be the systemic circulation. All right, systemic circulatory system. Now the pulmonary circulation system is different. As you can see, the pulmonary circulation system goes to the heart, goes to the lungs, sorry. So, okay, so this part here will be known as the pulmonary um, capillaries, the pulmonary system. So this will be the systemic capillaries, all right? And this will be the pulmonary system, whereby the blood, which is deoxygenated, flows, flows through the lungs, okay? Back into the heart. Now, at this point here, this is also considered deoxygenated blood. In blue, the chart, this is deoxy genated blood from the capillaries it flows to the heart of the amphibian and because uh, it needs to go to the lungs okay to receive the much needed oxygen and of course well let's say this is a red chalk 
this part here when it exits from the lungs it will be oxygenated blood okay it's rich rich with oxygen now so by the time halfway here it becomes rich with oxygen and it comes here and it will be pumped straight into the systemic um, system circulatory system so as you can see the question was what is the pulmonary circulation it will be um, the blood which is pumped from the heart to and from the lungs so this part here is known as the pulmonary circulatory system which is always blood from the heart to the lungs to and fro so therefore the answer is a the pulmonary circulation is the flow of blood from the heart to and from the lungs Okay, although that picture might um, not be very, very, um, you know, specific and accurate, but it's just a very rough um, uh, picture to guide your understanding about the pulmonary circulation system. Where is the answer for B? Um, the flow of blood from heart to other parts of the body is known as the systemic circulation system. Now let's move on to question 10. Why is the right ventricle smaller in size and less muscular? Well, A. It only supplies blood from heart to lungs. B. It only supplies blood from lungs to heart. C. It only supplies oxygenated blood to body tissues. D. It only supplies deoxygenated blood to body tissues. So what do you think? Um, boys and girls are the answer for question 10. Now, do you remember the right ventricle? Um, if you recall your lesson, um, it actually only pumps blood from the heart to the lungs. And this is with regards for the human circulatory system. So the answer is very obviously A. It only supplies blood from heart to lungs. Now from B, for B, supplying blood from lungs to heart, that's totally wrong because we know that lungs do not have right ventricles and C supplying oxygenated blood to body tissues that would be yes the left ventricle the left ventricle um, is larger in size and more muscular because it has to pump blood to every cell in the body so part C is obviously wrong and option D is well supplying deoxygenated blood but not to body tissues it would be to the lungs so that's why the answer is option A. Okay, let's look at some um, short structure questions. Question 11. What is a closed circulatory system? Now just roughly think about in your mind how you would phrase the idea and how you would write it in the spaces provided. circulatory system means blood flows under pressure via closed vessels continuously around the body and contraction of the heart creates pressure which maintains the flow of the blood and that would be your definition of a closed circulatory system that blood flows in closed vessels right now question 12 what is a sphygmomanometer and why is it important in humans' life? Hmm, I'm sure you would be able to answer this question. Okay, a sphygmomanometer is an instrument to detect blood pressure. It is important as normal blood pressure is 120 slash 80 millimeter mercury. If the pressure is high or low from the normal range, then many problems will be faced by an individual. People with high blood pressure will have high chances of getting heart attack or stroke, 
while wrists stirs with low blood pressure, are likely to receive insufficient blood supply to vital organs such as the brain and heart, which eventually causes permanent damage to the organs. So this is actually a bit of a memory work because you just have to memorize the function of the sphygmomanometer and um, of course you need to understand what are the effects of hypertension and low blood pressure to the human health. Now, let us move on to the last question of the day which is question 13. Explain the circulatory system in fish. So, I'm sure you can very quickly think of the answer. Do try. Now, fish has two chambered heart, consisting of one atrium and one ventricle. The circulatory system in fish is a single closed circulatory system which means that blood flows through the heart only once in a complete cycle. The oxygenated blood enters the atrium into the ventricle. And in the ventricle, the deoxygenated blood are pumped to the gills so that gaseous exchange occurs. Pressure in gills drop as the oxygenated blood leaves and flows directly to tissues in the body. Whereas the deoxygenated blood flows back to the heart and the cycle continues. Now to really help you understand this, let me draw for you a very simple uh, um, circulatory system for the fish. So the ventricles and the atria, they are rather small, right? So this part here, okay, and then this part here just branches into the, the gills, right? And then after that, what happens will be this part here goes straight. So, well, very simple. You will notice that um, this part here will be known as the systemic capillaries. And of course, over here, this part here is deoxygenated blood. Deoxygenated blood will flow through the atrium. Okay, this is the atrium. And this part here is the ventricle. So the fish circulation is very simple. Just one atria, one ventricle. It's a single closed circulatory system. And when it goes to the ventricle, it's still it's still deoxygenated blood. So that's why in blue I call it the deoxygenated blood. That's why I use a blue chalk to show that it's without oxygen. Okay, and of course it will try to flow to the gills all right so over here would be the gill capillaries all right this will be the gill the gill capillaries so at the gill capillaries just like the lungs and amphibians and humans there is gaseous exchange so therefore over here uh, this is not a septum not a septum, it's just to show you that um, halfway through the blood becomes oxygenated, rich with oxygen because at the gills, um, you know, there will be gaseous exchange. So now you will notice that the blood receives oxygen and is rich in oxygen and it will flow through to the systemic capillaries. It doesn't return back to the to the heart as you can notice it just blood just goes through the heart just one time that's why it's a single closed circulatory system after the gills it straight away goes to the systemic capillaries whereby gaseous exchange will happen again whereby the cells will take up the oxygen and give out carbon dioxide to the blood and that's why the blood becomes deoxygenated again and it will return back to the heart to receive back the much-needed oxygen from the gills. 
So this is basically um, the fish circulatory system as explained just now and this is just a simple drawing. We have actually finished our lesson for today on transport. We have compared the circulatory systems between the fish, amphibians and humans and we have also conceptualized the circulatory system and the implications of hypertension and low blood pressure on human health as well as the effects on the state of the heart contraction and heart relaxation. So we will be ending today's lesson. Thank you so much for watching ITTV. Um, we hope that you will continue to do your revision and understand the different diagrams in chapter one. And we look forward to see you again next time. Thank you very much and have a lovely day.